But one of the things that I did while I was reading was I wrote down um, all the words or kind of phrases, not even all the words or all the phrases, that were unfamiliar to me. I uh, had like a little kind of moleskin. I tore uh, some pages out. There's uh, nine pages here in, I think there's about 20 to 25 words per each side. And so what I thought I'd do, at least for part of this video, is look at some of these words that I wrote down and see if I can guess what any of them mean. This one's a bit hard to uh, read. Let's see. Second gravitacles, okay. S second gravitacles. How would you even say that? I should guess. I don't know. Like uh, this uh, having to do with like the second gravity radicals. Uh, Einsteinian, basically, right? I don't know. I've already. Let's see. Uh, oh, a woman in her second pregnancy. <laughs> I can't remember which American writer it was. I heard him speak and he said uh, that his job is to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. Uh, which, if you think about it, uh, women in their pregnancy, in their second pregnancies, can defy gravity, so... Wasn't I right all along? Hello, and welcome to books you haven't read. My name is Nate Rankin, and a book I have not read for a long time until recently, but that I have had is Darkenville's Cat by Alexander Theroux. This was a buddy read with uh, Travis over at Myers Mega Fictional Reviews, as well as John, who is uh, at Tumescent TBR on Instagram. I believe he only has an Instagram. I do not believe he has a YouTube. I know I am also disappointed that he didn't choose the screen name Boner Books. But this is a famous book. Um, I mean, famous within certainly the niche that I read. I think it's um, sort of notably been boosted by, so it appeared on Anthony Burgess's list of like, you know, top 99 books. Uh, it's not exactly the 20th century, but it's kind of the mid 20th century. So like a top 99, uh, his favorites, um, Anthony Burgess, Clockwork Orange, and uh, as well as I know that uh, Stephen Moore has been a huge proponent of Theroux generally, um, as well as especially this book. And if you're going to be crude about it, the uh, book is kind of well known for two things. One, it's rarity. You can't find it for I think less than a hundred bucks used online these days. And uh, two, it has this incredibly, incredibly, uh, I mean, whatever word you want to use, rich, dense, encyclopedic, uh, archaic, um, wide-ranging vocabulary. Okay, here's a good one that I can hardly probably pronounce. Anti-homo-logumina. Okay, so anti, I mean, that's against, right? Homo is sameness. Logumina, La like, I don't know, I'm guessing that has something to do with words, so against the sameness of words. O-U-M-E-N-A. Okay, so Homo Logumina is books of the New Testament acknowledged as authoritative and canonical. So anti-Homo Logumina, uh, I guess, is like having to do with stuff like the Gnostic Gospels or something. I think it was Seth from Waste Mailing List that had this Twitter thread uh, recently about this sort of supposed, uh, I don't know, triumvirate of uh, difficult bro lit books, right? Ulysses, uh, Gravity's Rainbow, and Infinite Jest. And basically he went on to make a thread um, in a point that I largely agree with, have no qualms with it, um, that Infinite Jest is not of the type that those other two are. Uh, with all due respect to Infinite Jest, um, there's, it's just not quite achieving, um, and he goes into it in his thread a little more. It's not quite achieving what those other two are. I agree with that, and if I were going to sort of pick like a tier or try and talk about the level of difficulty or of literariness of Darkenville's Cat, I would associate it with Infinite Jess. It's much more in that category. So, what's this book about? It is about a 29-year-old uh, teacher, English teacher at a women's college in mid-century, I believe it's uh, supposed to roughly parallel Theroux's own life, so late 60s, early 70s, somewhere around there. And this 29-year-old teacher uh, falls in love with one of his 18-year-old students. And this book is the story of their sort of falling in love and then falling out of love over the course of several years, I think about four or five years. As I mentioned, this was a buddy read, and I think it was Travis uh, that brought up that it reminded him of uh, the recognitions. I think he 
read the recognitions rather recently. And I got very similar vibes. Uh, I think like Wyatt and Alaric Darkenville, the protagonist of this book, and uh, like Stephen Dedalus are all sort of of the same feather, of the same type, in that they are sort of semi-autobiographical representations of their author um, who, uh, you know, approach their art almost like priests do religion. One of the things, speaking of James Joyce, that I was reading concurrently, oh, here it is. I am currently still reading through the uh, Richard Elman biography of James Joyce. I am audiobooking it, but I also have a, a physical copy for visual sake. And what struck me while I was kind of reading these two books is how much Isabel Rosthorn, the 18-year-old student Darkenville falls in love with, she sounds and reminds me so much of Nora, or kind of a, of the type of character that Nora is in James Joyce's life, um, in that she is uh, described as kind of very plain. Um, I don't know if simple is the right word, but very non-literary for sure. Um, certainly a questionable, I don't know, intellectual match with um, a man of such letters, to put it bluntly. Nora didn't get and wasn't, uh, you sense, uh, all that impressed by her husband's work. Um, it's almost like they were kind of of different religions, you know, like if Joyce is this priest of art, then uh, he had a wife who was like a poetical agnostic, more or less. Thixotropes. Uh, so this is a thing that Theroux does a lot is he uses like arcane words for stuff we're actually pretty familiar with. So I am going to guess that thixotropes uh, is just an old fashioned word for thought what it's obviously got to be, right guys? Thixotropes. Thixotropy is a phenomenon where the viscosity of some fluids depends on the time of share rate, and hence thixotropy is a time-dependent phenomenon. So, uh, yeah, basically thoughts. It's, you know, just hose over there. Quickly on the love thing, because I don't actually have as much to say about kind of the love half of the book as I do the hate half. I think it's a little hard to talk about it as love sort of per se. What we're really talking about when we talk about love in Darkenville's Cat is a kind of a projection of passion and our illusions of love. Again, that we are projecting onto other people because that's very much, and that is pretty obvious, I think, um, going throughout the whole book. There's that kind of mismatch between uh, these two in ways that certainly they are rendered extremely unique. I think that's another thing that uh, Theroux is um, really good at, not just, I think, I, I get the sense it's general across his work, but it seems as though he wants to make each sentence that he writes completely unique. And I think that fits well, that style fits well in a book that is about intense passion, intense love, uh, romance, uh, because uh, uh, love has that way of sort of feeling, even though it's the most kind of, one of the most universal feelings, um, that romantic love that has no doubt been repeated billions upon billions of times, it feels absolutely and totally unique to our own sort of universes of our mind, if that makes sense. And so I think the, the style overall affords that, uh, renders that well, and, and it's great. There are plenty of, uh, even though you kind of know it's all a hoax in the end, or um, you know there's kind of, uh, uh, it, it, it wasn't ever that good to begin with, there are these very tender passages, touching movements, moving scenes um, that, that Theroux does indeed render. All of that said, that's my praiseworthiness about the love half, but what really struck out to me and what more I think defines this book for me, is the power of hatred. So I want to read a quote from William H. Gass's uh, Paris Review interview. He did this in 1979, um, by the way, um, about the time that uh, Theroux was writing this book. If someone asks me, why do you write? I can reply by pointing out that it is a very dumb question. Nevertheless, there is an answer. I write because I hate. A lot. Hard. And if someone asks me the inevitable next dumb question, why do you write the way you do? I must answer that I wish to make my hatred acceptable because my hatred is much of me, if not the best part. Writing is a way of making the writer acceptable to the world. Every cheap, dumb, nasty thought, every despicable desire, every noble sentiment, every expensive 
taste. I was thinking a lot about this quote from William H. Gass while I was reading Darkenville's Cat. Um, I think about this quote a lot in general, uh, especially the part where he goes, I wish to make my hatred acceptable because my hatred is much of me, if not the best part. And I don't know, I think about that line in particular because uh, it's one of those lines that felt true long before I really had the vocabulary to describe why it's so true, like on a personal level for me. You know, what does it mean to say that your hatred is, you know, possibly the best part of you? I think for me, it's about the fact that, like, your hatred is something that you feel alone because you don't necessarily want to share the ugliest parts of you uh, with or in front of the world, right? Your hatred is your deepest privacy and you encounter it mostly with yourself. And so, of course, you become attached to the things that you are alone with. Carcist, K-A-R-C-I-S-T, that is obviously a narcissist who drives a car, uh, but it's a car that starts with a K, so it's either a clown car or a KKK car. So, uh, racist uh, car um, narcissist is what I'm going to guess. Carcist, a person who practices magic, sorcerer or magician. If you're paying attention, it's very obvious from the beginning um, that Darkenville hates Quinzyburg. This is the town where the college is. Um, he hates the people there. He hates the faculty and staff. He has all of these snide... It's also another thing that this book is doing is it's very much a Yankee comes down south story. Um, in the second half, he gets uh, a job up in Harvard, you know, and fair enough, this was still... He has a seething hatred for Southerners, Darkenville does. Um, for the sort of relics and remnants of the Confederacy that still infect it. He thinks it's backwards. He thinks the people are ignoble. Um, this is very obvious. He's a man full of hate from page one, but he is able to displace that from himself and also maybe from the reader because so much of the first half of the book is dedicated to his falling in love. Once we get to the second half, though, um, we are introduced to the character of Dr. Crucifer, who is like a professor emeritus um, at Harvard. There was really this kind of eureka moment for me um, while I was reading it, because while I was reading this book, it had just... It was just shortly after, like, all of the Andrew Tate uh, stuff, and I thought uh, one of the hot takes that I had in the Buddy Read group chat was that... Uh, uh, Dr. Crucifer is just a more erudite Andrew Tate. Um, now, obviously, there are some differences between the guys, right? Andrew Tate is much more classically uh, masculine and, and um, hypersexual, while Crucifer is uh, a eunuch and, um, you know, abhors the idea of sex now, um, ever since he has made himself a eunuch. But what I mean, I'm comparing their uh, misogyny as enlightenment ethos, basically like red pill culture. And they're both, you know, red pill Reddit dudes to one degree or another. And it's that sort of encyclopedic instinct. Uh, and literally there's this chapter called uh, the misogynist's library. That's just a list of books. Um, and I think a lot of them are real. And then I think a lot of them are fake. It's literally literally just voluminous um, the way in which uh, his antipathy, in which Dr. Christopher's antipathy toward women, especially, um, he is kind of this voice, it's kind of said um, either I, it's said pretty directly that Dr. Christopher may just be a voice inside Darkenville's head, which makes perfect sense. But he is um, pointing at kind of Isabel in particular as an impediment to in, in women in general and uh, sexual partners, I guess, in general, as impediments to uh, artistic achievement and success. And that's kind of the dark charms that he's trying to cast on Darkenville. Mon of Thongs? I'm gonna guess, by the way, uh, not looking at my computer screen. Uh, I mean, my first thought is that it's gonna be like the opposite of diphthong. Like a diphthong, I think, is where you take something that's, you know, a vowel, one syllable, and sort of stretch it out into uh, into two syllables. It's like a, it's like a speaking thing. A sound formed by combination of two vowels. So a diphthong is a sound formed by the combination of two vowels in a single syllable, uh, in which the sound begins as one vowel and moves towards another, as in coin, loud, and side. Wait, side? How is that? 
So monothong is the opposite of that. So I was right, is the important point. Both, uh, getting back to the Andrew Tate, um, Crucifer comparisons, both are excessive in their evil to like the point of incredulity. Um, and that largely seems to be the point, you know, like the shock value, the provocateurness is the point. One wonders, you know, how can Dr. Crucifer exist? And then you look over your shoulder at your own ridiculous and malevolent world. Um, and so that made me kind of respect it in a way that I otherwise wouldn't. I think if I had like a stylistic critique with this and who knows, like maybe the way in which kind of, uh, Okay, so Crucifer largely kind of monologues and gives his homilies of evil, and there's just not a lot of stuff going on besides him talking. Um, in you know, the first half of the book, at least, you're getting, um, you're going around like the town or whatever, and you're seeing um, Darkenville interact with students or people or whatever. The second half of the book, it just feels like it's a lot of Crucifer talking. Who knows? Maybe he is. Um, through these monologues, he's uh, conjuring up. I've never read this the whole way through, but maybe he's doing it in like a, you know, Satan from Paradise Lost type of way. Maybe there's something that it's invocating or recalling that I'm just too much of a scrub to appreciate. I don't know. But I thought that ultimately that stylistic choice kind of uh, brought down the fictional edifice and it was just kind of throwing ideas in ink at the page and seeing what would stick. Uh, this next word just looks cool and it definitely feels like a word I should know, but I don't. It's called Sky Godlin. So uh, I'm gonna uh, guess that it has something to do with having to do, I don't know, is it too obvious to guess that it's having to do with gods in the sky? Sky Godlin. One who, instead of looking straight ahead, looks upwards. Oh, I like that. So instead of going fur to dur, you're like, huh, sky goblin. So he's like goggling at this guy almost. I gave this book four out of five stars on Goodreads. Um, that was kind of my enjoyment meter of it. Uh, there are, I don't know, there are just some things that uh, in the book that really do make it feel like a slog that do, uh, I don't know, don't necessarily contribute to the, uh, uh, to the immersion of the reader into the text. It, it feels like it wants to push you away at some points. Anyway, uh, my respect meter is definitely a full five out of five, um, but my enjoyment was over to four. Uh, I am absolutely interested in reading more through. You can see kind of right here, right back there, that's the start. I've been getting um, all of the Tough Poets Press uh, through books. Um, so fables, early stories, later stories, and truisms. Truisms actually kind of looks like, that's the teal colored one right there. That actually <laughs> looks kind of the most interesting to me. I'm interested to know if anyone's read those or if anyone's read Darkenville's Cats. Um, you know, how did you feel about it? What did you think? Um, because it's so hard to get, it's like $100, I think, the cheapest you can get it right now. I would be hesitant to recommend <laughs> um, buying this book for, like, I don't know, a book that's four out of five stars, I don't want to spend a hundred dollars on that. Your mileage may vary. Certainly scour your libraries. There are online places that you can get an e-pub of this pretty easily. So thank you for watching. Please subscribe. Uh, I will try not to have, I have a backlog of books and videos that I just kind of need to get around to doing, but I haven't, it's been a busy fall. Let's just say that. Um, hopefully more stuff soon. Till next time. So I recapitulated a lot of my life. I had been in a monastery for a short time and been in a seminary. And the psychiatrist kind of looked, was looking at me in a kind of querulous way and said to me, You're always trying to get out of the world, he said. Satire is a kind of great tradition of inflicting pain, of being disappointed and inflicting pain. There's a kind of personal partisan, no punch pulling involved in satire. Because we're living in a real, to me, a really savage time. That's the kind of pain I'm inflicting. That's the kind of no punch pulling, unsparing, pitiless, even cruel attitude that I try to launch in the book.